to give you a little bit of a round of applause. So thanks again for joining us. Thank you. I know, listening to all that, I'm like, gosh, my life sounds exhausting. Um, <laughs> You've been a busy girl. <laughs> Sounds exhausting. No, but it's actually great. And it's not just me. I am one tiny part of all of these amazing things that happen. And I think that that's what's really beautiful about things like this is these kinds of intimate gatherings and just getting to know people are a way that we all can collaborate together to make the world a better place. So it's nice to see everybody here. And it's also fabulous to just um, have an opportunity to share a little bit about what we do and where we came from and sing the praises of all the amazing community partners that we have. So where do we start? I feel like it's tonight's kind of like <laughs> speed dating, right? Which um, I, I haven't dated in a while, so we'll see how I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we'll get you started with your first question. Um, so how did your journey to entrepreneurship begin? So it's interesting, even as we were, I was listening to something, I've never really called myself an entrepreneur. Like I've never written down in like a job. I wonder if it has anybody like written down entrepreneur in a job description. I don't like, do people write that down or do we just call ourselves those? Oh, okay. George has. So that's, that's good. But I'm like, am I really an entrepreneur? That sounds so fancy. I don't think I actually fit the bar for that. But then when I listen to you speak of all of the projects that we've done, I'm like, oh, I think that's what defines an entrepreneur is, is such of that. And I've always had a passion for trying out and getting to know and understand a lot of diverse things and diverse people. So for me, I think that's probably where it started was really just being curious. And um, we lost my dad almost two years ago. And one of the most beautiful things that so many people around us told me was your dad had the most beautiful curiosity for life. And I don't think it was until after we lost him that I realized that so many decisions I've made in my life are because I'm just naturally a very curious person. And so I think that curiosity kind of led me to being an entrepreneur because someone said, no, like, oh, oh no, you can't do that. Or, oh, no, there's nothing like that that really exists. I'm like, but why? Why is that the case? And <laughs> um, just that curiosity, I think, has really led me to um, reevaluate and and continue to seek out solutions. That's awesome. Um, so did you have any, you know, kind of like early on signs of entrepreneurship um, where you kind of, you know, maybe dabbled in Oh, I feel like I was like making, uh, making all kinds of things from a young age and trying to, trying to sell them. I learned how to drive, essentially driving my dad's tractor in Missouri. And I think I got paid $10 for every neighbor's lawn that I mowed. And to me, that was like, the, the best thing to be able to do something to help our neighbors out and to make a little money at the same time. So I think I was probably about 10 when I started doing that. Oh, wow. And by the age 14, I grew up as a gymnast. gymnast and by the age 14, I was teaching gymnastics. Um, so I think I've just had it in me to work from a young age and always thinking of innovative ways, whether it was selling lemonade or making shrinky dink uh, earrings and necklaces and trying to sell them to the to the neighbors. I think I've always kind of had that spark in me. That's awesome. Um, so more recently, I know that you focused um, focus on Peely Group. So can you tell us a little bit more about how that exactly came about? Sure. How did you wind up creating that? So, I mean, to back it up a little bit, um, I'm from Missouri. I moved to Hawaii when I was 19 years old. I had $500 in um, my checking account at the time. I think I had a Chase credit card with a $500 limit on it, and I had two suitcases. And so for me, um, moving here was the first time I wrote a business proposal to my parents, and I said, listen, it's cheaper to go to in-state community college in Hawaii than it is to go to state college here in Missouri. So if you guys help me for one year in Hawaii, I will get a job at Dukes. I will work as a server and make a bunch of money and be able to pay my own way through college. So that that's what that's what got me here. That's what made made me want to pursue a life here. And now looking at Peely Group with my husband, it really reflects some of the similar values and thoughts that I had, What was, which was showing up for community, getting to know them, 
Um, I always had a passion for food and cooking and with my husband as a chef, that just made a really wonderful pair. And then at the time that the two of us met, I was deeply involved in food policy um, council work, which I think that several people on this call, if I'm seeing um, some of the names here, were part of food policy work with um, me back when I was meeting my husband. So the fact that he was a chef, he was very dedicated to local food and he was very dedicated to communities. And we were working in parallel paths, but just had never crossed paths and, but had the same passion. We come from two very different backgrounds. You know, me growing up in the Midwest, him growing up here, a Japanese local boy in the back of Manoa. Um, he didn't really feel like he fit in in his space. I didn't really feel like I fit in in my space. And then here we are many years later meeting together and working on very similar um, long-term goals, but doing it in different ways. So I think when we met um, it was it was first a business relationship. Actually, I had hired him for one of my clients from under my umbrella. Oh, really? And we just clicked personality wise. I was dating someone else at the time. So I had no I had no interest in being romantically involved with anyone. But I thought, oh, he's a good guy. We have a lot of the same values. So we got to yeah. know each other. And um, about a year and a half later, we started Peely Group together. So we actually started a business together before we um, were married. And Peely Group was our way of providing healthy, locally sourced and super creative food um, to events. And because I ran an event and PR company, hmm. it was just a natural fit. We were right. always looking for a caterer who right. could do these kinds of innovative things. Okay. And so that's, that's how the original idea came from. We then um, had a partnership with Hawaiian Airlines. We opened a cafe. We opened another cafe after that. Um, we opened another cafe after that. And all, but all of those were really based. They were never about food. Food was never the first goal of the spaces. Right. If I look back on Taste Table, which several people here were probably at our grand opening, um, that was about community. It was about bringing people together. And we did all these collaborative um, networking dinners for folks. We had guest chefs in all the time. It was built on community. Same thing for our for our next restaurant space. It was all about bringing people together and community. So food was the vessel, I think, for our passion. Mm -hmm. But it was really always about building community. Wow, that's that's really great. And it sounds like you really stepped in um, during you've stepped in for the community during this crisis. Um, how did that evolve? Um, I know that you've you know achieve some excellent, you know, incredible numbers in terms of, um, you know, the relief that you've been able to provide. Um, but how, like, how did that, what were the thought processes behind that? So I think for us, so with Chef Oui, we had our kind of baseline work that we did collaborating with different communities. When we saw that COVID was coming around, um, one of our staff lives in Japan. So they were a few weeks ahead of us and kind of understanding the magnitude of what was happening. And so I was thinking like, oh, this is going to be a problem. And this is right when we knew everyone was gearing up for spring break. Kids were getting ready to go on spring break. Right. Hotels were ordering, you know, how much more food do hotels order? order before spring break, I assume it's right. a lot. And I was just thinking in my head, like all these hotels are going to have food and they're going to have nowhere to send it. Right. And then there's all these kids on the West side who like are not going to be able to make it to a school to pick up lunch. How are we going to feed our kids? Right. And my husband and I just started kind of talking out loud about these things. And I think that night he went to his office to work. I was in the kitchen cleaning up and we both at the same time around that same time, but separately reached out to Kim and Jack Johnson and who are friends of ours and said, Hey, are all these schools going to close down? Do you guys have ideas? What are you going to do? And we reached out to a few more people and just this small hui of people came together and started throwing around ideas of how we could support. So mm -hmm. we, it really just wasn't about like, we had this great idea of how we were going to solve a problem. It was more approaching folks we knew who did this work and saying, how can we be of service to you? We have a, a great network of individuals around us that we think we can rally. Um, how can we be of service? So we just kind of served as this Grand Central Station for like the first six weeks with our event staff trying to take all the information we're getting from different people and do like a matchmaking service. So I joke 
that I felt like we were like the tinder of um, COVID food response. We were like, <laughs> okay, this hotel has this and this guy can cook for this community and just really trying to match people together. So yeah, um, it was, we're logistics people at Under right. My Umbrella. And so we just yes. applied our logistics skill set to yeah. kind of a whole new space we hadn't been in before. I think I, my answer to um, what is something new that I've taken up during COVID is like, I can now tell you how many thousands of pounds of bananas can fit onto a pallet and how many of those pallets you can put into a truck. And <laughs> and those are things, those are skills I never thought that I would have, but they're things that I've learned through this pandemic because it was what was necessary to get things from point A to point B. That's awesome. And um, what do you kind of see as, as in terms of like later down the line? Um, you know, post COVID, do you see yourself kind of continuing on with your, your current efforts? Yeah. So to back for Chef Hui and to just kind of give a picture of where we're at right now, because mm -hmm. I think, you know, we've been doing a lot of the same things for the past 11 months, which are continuing to rescue. Obviously, rescue is, you know, was a short lived thing. People stopped ordering food. A lot of our um, farms are thinking about not growing food anymore. And so for mm -hmm. us, we started focusing on how we could raise funds to mm -hmm. bring in um, a way to continue to pay people to do what we so them to do. Our farmers, we need them to be growing food here. We've been working, you know, for two decades to really build back up our local food system. And I just couldn't watch all that work go to the wayside because all of our restaurants were closed. And then for our restaurants, the same thing. These, This is our culture. These are the people that make our neighborhoods the space that we feel at home. They're the ones who teach us about new crops we don't know how to use. They're the, the, the place you go when you've had a bad day, the place you go when you have a good day. So we wanted to find a way that we could raise funds, support local restaurants that were locally owned, and try and target working with restaurants who have a dedication to buying local food. So in just the first two months, I think we had about 40 restaurants that we onboarded that we paid an $8 per meal stipend, so per person, to make food for communities that were in need. This was at a time when most everything was closed down. So schools were in need of meals. Um, so many Kapuna were at home and in need of meals. So that's where we focused really hard in the beginning was um, on our Kapuna and on our Keiki and getting meals to them. If you fast forward a little bit now, we're still doing a lot of meals, prepared meals, because we do have a lot of people who are still homebound. But we've tried to go a little bit um, back to what our original roots were before COVID, which was encouraging people to cook and to connecting them, you know, in a real manner to their food. So we've been doing a lot of meal kits. We've partnered with Kukua Hawaii Foundation and have partnered with many chefs to create recipe cards and utilize local ingredients to make um, simple to make at home meal kits. And often we do cooking videos to go alongside those. And for us, that's a way to give family something to do at home yeah. um, with people like Hawaii Ulu Co-op. They've worked to help us find ways to incorporate science and education and learning into these cooking demos. Okay. So we still try and provide those to people that are in need, um, but not just make it about this like rapid response um, getting them a meal because it, you know, it's just like fishing, teaching them how to fish versus just continuing to give people fish. And I think that's for me, a personal part of um, the solutions for the future right. is, you know, the food bank model as, as necessary as they are is not really a solution. It's a band aid that we've continued to rely on. And I think COVID has created an opportunity to right. see how we can perhaps think outside that model and have a more equitable food system that allows people to have access to local food. So I'm excited for those kinds of um, projects in the future. They're not gonna be short term and they're not gonna be as quick of a satisfaction of giving someone a meal kit and then getting a picture of them cooking it. There's something right. very gratifying about, yeah. about that full circle process. Um, yeah. So some of the future work I think will be much longer and slower but now is the time for it. Awesome. Well, I think that you are doing a great job with, um, you know, being able to keep folks employed and and taking advantage of some of the resources, food resources that already existed and that could have gone to waste, um, and just bringing that together with folks 
um, in need. So that's that's definitely inspiring. Um, I think for a lot of the folks who are joining us, um, I, I think that they'd be curious to hear, you know, what individuals can do to potentially join in with um, COVID relief. Um, if you have any ideas um, or suggestions. So the first thing we always say is check on your neighbor. Um, what a better space we'd be in if everyone just checked on their neighbor next door to see how they were doing and if they were in need of anything. And you know, even for Mark and I and all of our staff, we were doing all this work in communities statewide, but we all committed to making sure we are still checking in on our neighbors. And yeah. we've actually adopted a few people around, you know, around our neighborhood that we know are in need. They can't get out. They're very high risk. And if we all did something that was safe and small, I think that would be such a big thing. Um, specific to Chef Hui, they can always visit our website and sign up for our e-newsletter. We send out volunteer opportunities. We send out grant information. We send out all kinds of things for um, our community that we hope can help them to um, support people and not just us as Chef Hui, but various people, whether they're in need of volunteers or if someone needs to be connected to something, that's a great way to support as well. But it's Everyone has something, we say everyone has something to bring to the table. Everyone has a skill set, whether that's entering data, um, helping to glean a farm and you know get products out, driving. We have lots of people that volunteer to pick things up from point A to point B and drop them off. So everyone has something to share. And I think just finding what you're comfortable with sharing and what you're good at and finding a way to be, put it to good use. That's awesome, Amanda, um, and good for all of us to remember in the audience. Um, so kind of going back to a little bit more of your story um, as an entrepreneur. Um, so could you walk us through maybe some of the more difficult moments that you've had in your career? Um, could be throughout this time or could be prior. Um, what were some of the challenges? Well, I mean, for anyone here who started their own business, uh, I think Hawaii is a beautiful space base to, to test out starting a business because um, there's so much collaboration that happens here. And if you're willing to work really hard, I think that you can, you can make a space for yourself here. But um, graduating from college as a documentary filmmaker, working in that world for uh, some years, and then moving on to the nonprofit world, I just saw that there was this opportunity to to fulfill a need that was um, in the nonprofit realm. And so I started my business, not like I'm gonna start a business and here's my business plan and here's how all the numbers go together. I'm like, somebody really needs to do this. Like a lot of nonprofits would be doing so much better if they just had somebody who did this for them. I love doing that, I should do that. And so I think probably like struggle wise for the first five years of my business, I was just struggling to try and figure out how to even run a business. I don't have an MBA. Um, I didn't, I figured this out through doing it for the past 15 years. And so I would say that some of the hardest times were those first five years of starting my business. I didn't want to take a loan from anyone because I didn't mm -hmm. want to, you know, overcommit myself. My, I come from a very um, simple family who was filled with lots of love, but, you know, having like, a super successful career was not a goal. Our a goal for my family was to be a really good family together. So my dad was a welder. He went to work at 6 a.m. He was home by 3 p.m. My mom quit her job at the bank to stay home and take care of us. So um, going down this pathway that was not a comfort space for me, it wasn't something I'd grown up in, in running a business or really you know, participating in a large corporate world was really scary. But it was also, I think, that... Um, all those lessons I learned along the way that allowed us to continue growing in a really authentic and real way and also prepared us for times like this when things aren't um, as easy as they usually could be in a world and now you have all these additional challenges on on your plate and saying like, oh, I've kind of gone through a lot. I think I can like revisit the table and figure out how to shift things around and make it work. So the struggles are, are things that if I would have known, like if I could have coached my 25 year old self when I started my business, mm -hmm. I would have 
told myself to not be so stubborn and to ask for help more um, and to not just always have to try and figure things out on my own. And mm -hmm. I think it took about seven years to really own that. Mm -hmm. And once I started asking for help and saying like, it's okay that I don't know how to do that. Um, I can hire somebody to do that for me. That was a big shift for me. And that really allowed the business to grow was owning my own mistakes and saying like, I'm not really good at that. Let me find somebody who is. Gotcha. That That's really great. Um, and I think, you know, speaking to that, um, topic of funding in particular. Um, what advice do you have for folks who are also in that first five year stage and they're looking at how how should I fund my business? Um, do you have any recommendations for- This is where folks? I say, that's not my expertise. I am not the, like, I am not a financial advisor. The way that I did it, I don't know if in this day and age, I would advise other people to do it in the same way. Um, because I literally, I just started my business with a little bit of money that I had saved up. It was just me. I worked with clients like the Surfrider Foundation and Sustainable Coastlines and Sierra Club. And I charged them barely anything to help plan their conferences and their fundraisers and just to build my name and just to be able to have the experience and to build the trust in that community. And so it was a slow, it was a slow process and it took a long time before I was even able to hire on an assistant and someone to, to help with the business. So as far as like, would I have applied for a loan to so I could have grown my business bigger from the beginning? I think my answer would still be no, because that just wasn't my approach to it. I've always taken an approach of growing at the speed that I that didn't feel too risky. Right. Um, I'm just now in the past two years taking on um, much bigger risk by hiring people in you know manager and director roles, and I now have a team of eight. And that is something that it's almost doubled in the past four years. And for yeah. me, I don't want to have a huge team of hundreds of people. Yeah. I want to have a small team that feels like a family who's committed to the same um, future goals for for our clients and for our earth. And that has been that has been a really good way for me to do it. But yeah. I don't know if I would recommend it to somebody else. Um, unless you're young and you like to work a lot in your 20s and early 30s, then maybe I would. Okay, gotcha. I think that that's um, a common question we get, you know, for especially the folks in the first year or two of their businesses. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what would you say are like some of the signs where you're just like, yeah, we're getting some momentum here, like we're getting some traction in the business, this feels good. Um, what would you say were some of those like moments, aha moments in your, in your career? I think for us, um, some of the clients, and when I was listening to the introduction that, you know, we work primarily with nonprofits, uh, that is that is true. But I think our our plate is much more balanced now in the amount of nonprofit and for-profit organizations that we have. And it was always my goal to fulfill this role of providing strategy and creativity and logistics planning to um, organizations, but now being able to do that kind of work with large corporations is really fun. It, prevent, it presents a lot of new challenges, um, but working in the corporate world and applying models that we essentially created for the nonprofit world is kind of a beautiful thing. And I feel like it's something that um, I hope is more the future of how corporations work. And, and you and I have talked about that, of kind of breaking the mold and doing things like me bringing my newborn baby to a board meeting and running yeah. a board meeting with a baby strapped on. Those those are risks that I took in the way that we built our business, but be able being able to do that successfully and now looking back on it and bringing my employees' kids to things and being able to feel not nearly as uncomfortable as we felt when we were doing it um, five and seven years ago feels like really good growth that we, at the end of the day, I don't know how much um, impact we have, but we are part of a movement to break down some of the old molds of what it means to be a mother, right. what it means to be a business owner, what it means to be a female. Yeah. Um, and that for me is a really great point of growth. That's awesome. It sounds like you're really leading by example in, in that space um, and kind of paving the way so that you're kind of creating <laughs> new norms. <laughs> 
different from the other kinds of new norms that we're, <laughs> we're working with right now, but that's creating right. new norms. <laughs> so that's great to hear, Amanda. Um, so in terms of like a degree, I think education is um, something that, you know, sometimes people feel like they need to continue their path in education um, in order to start a business. Um, other times people, you know, we hear these stories of people who drop out and um, are still extremely successful. Um, how much weight would you, do you put on having a degree? Um, how relevant do you think that is when it, when it comes to work? So I think that it's more relevant to work in a restaurant and be of service to other people and clean up other people's plates and and um, be at someone else's service than it is to. No, I'm joking, but this is something that I that I always say is that I always one of my first interview questions are Have you worked in a restaurant? Because I yeah. feel like if you've handled the stress of a restaurant and that gives you a life skill that you can't teach to somebody. And I think that's what I really wonder. And I love having so many of my employees are under the age of thirty. Some of them have just graduated from college, and I'm so curious about this question because for me, getting the degree was really a personal goal for me. Um, I loved school. I loved learning. I loved the entire process. It took me longer. I was working at the same time. So I, it took me five years to graduate. I started at a community college and then I moved to UH, but that's what I what could afford. And for me and where I came from, I was really proud to be the first person in my immediate family to get a four-year degree. And it, I think for me, it wasn't about how much money I was going to make because I had a degree. It was just a personal goal for me to okay. do so. I've dabbled with the idea of getting a master's or a PhD in something, and, I've, and that's still on the table and not necessarily for the paper or for any sort of like financial gain that it would provide, but just I think going back to that place of curiosity for me. And yeah. I really do wonder, you know, for I have a five and a seven-year-old daughter, and I think, you know, we're saving money. We have a 401k. Are, are we saving for college? Is that what I'm saving money for is for, for their college degree? Are they going to go to a four-year college? Um, what is college going to look like when my children are of age to go to college? And yeah. that is a huge question mark for me. I think particularly after the past year of the pandemic, we've really challenged what getting an education looks like. And, and there's been a, a movement that will not change of people will go to college differently from now on, no matter what. And I'm really excited to see what that looks like. But I think that um, getting getting a degree and going to school and then also remembering to create a lot of time for life experiences. I was doing internships almost in my entire college career. And I have to say, I think I learned more from my internships than I did in any classroom that I sat in. So I feel like real life experience, um, at least for my realm of work, um, I'm not a mathematician, I'm not a surgeon, and I'm, you know, I trust when I go in for a surgery that hopefully my doctor had a lot of schooling. I'm not sure if uh, just like on the fly works in that in that particular case, but I'm very curious to see what education looks like. And I think it's important because it teaches you how to stay dedicated to something. Right. And I think that that's a, a really big skill is working hard and, and having the drive to complete something even when it feels like it's too hard. So those are some of the best things I took away from a formal education. Um, but we have, you know, we have the internet, we have so many books, the amount of things I've learned from reading books and reading articles is, is such a gift. So I think we are just at a point where we have access to so much information that learning yeah. looks different. Gotcha. Um, and then for some of the folks who are, you know, specifically focused on marketing, um, how do you balance metrics with real life experience? I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> we, we, well, we joke about this all the time because I think for some folks who are just coming out of college and, you know, they're taught like everything is about metrics. Everything is by how many likes something has or how many views it has or, you know, how well it's trending in areas. And that is important to a certain degree. But I always really like to push back on authenticity. And our, our viewing audience um, 
my age, older, younger, all of the above. We want authentic information. And we now are much more in control of demanding that we have authentic information. And so I think in any marketing that you do, it has to be authentic. Yeah. If it feels at all like it's not your own voice and it doesn't fit the brand of your company or your organization, I think people really see right through that. And so my push is always to stay true and be authentic. And in whatever you're doing, make sure the people that you're collaborating with are approaching things from an authentic space as well. Awesome. Um, and so th throughout your entrepreneurial journey, who has been your biggest inspiration? Oh, that's a hard one. Can I do more than one? Mm, <laughs> yes. Okay. So, I mean, overall, my mother, who, again, is not an entrepreneur, um, she, w she was a teller at a bank. She had me. She cried every day when she went to work and said, I would rather be at home with my daughter than be at work, and I'm going to find a way to make this work. And she did it by babysitting for other kids while she raised me, and I had the most in my mind, I had the most fabulous childhood playing outside, being in the woods. I always had other kids around to socialize with. And the way that she just adapted to this like new change in life by having children, um, I've always thought about what she would do and what decisions she would make because she was just so adaptable. No matter where she went, what, you know, whether it was at school, if we were camping somewhere, anywhere that we were, she could adapt and make friends with the people that we were around. And I think she had a really special talent for making people feel seen and making them feel heard and building trust with them. And I think that so much of business are about those key um, those core things you bring with you to a relationship. And so even though she wasn't a CEO, you know, she wasn't this like business woman who I looked up to like, wow, look at how successful she is in her career. Yeah. Um, there was times in my life where I thought like, oh, I feel sad for my mom. I wish she would have like been able to like pursue. She wanted to be a nurse and she never got to do that. And I felt sorry for her. And I think probably like, you know, my high school time into early college. And then now as a mom and as a business owner, I see that so many of the decisions that she made helped me to make really good decisions in my business mm -hmm. and laid the foundation that allowed us to come to where we are now. And that mm -hmm. many of the things she was doing were actually very strategic and she was very good at reading people and being able to get them excited about doing what she needed them to do. And I feel like often that's like my job. That's what I'm doing is trying to get people excited about moving things and like a positive direction that they need to go in. So she's been a huge um, inspiration to me in that sense. Mm -hmm. And another one just to touch on um, quickly is Edgy Lee, who is the um, first filmmaker that I worked for. I graduated um, thinking I was going to be a documentary filmmaker and seeing how that woman could um, sit at a table with all men and have everyone's attention and say, nope, this is how it's going to go. This is how we're going to do it and not be scared. Um, and even, you know, as a as a woman who was sitting with predominantly white men and was an Asian woman, I was very inspired by her power and her passion and her commitment to pushing for what she felt like was right, even though um, she was sitting at a table that not yet was really made for her to sit at, that she never she never approached any space as if that were the case. And I always found that to be a huge inspiration. She took risk and she just kind of pushed, you know, pushed the limits a little bit. That's awesome. Um, the next question I want to ask our audience. Um, so uh, how many, I want to see on your hands, and if it consumes both hands, then we won't need to do more than that. Um, but how many years of entrepreneurial experience you have? Um, so if you have one year, you're going to say this, two years, this, three years, this. Okay, so if I can just see how many years, and if it's more than 10. <laughs> All right, we've got, we've got <laughs> some good answers here. Okay, um, so, um, so the question that I have for you is, what is the best piece of advice you have for someone who's just starting out as an entrepreneur? 
make sure that what you're doing is your pet like at least feeds your passion or is such a brilliant idea that creates a lot of space for you to still do what you're passionate about. I think that for that for me is a piece of advice. I, I feel like if you are if you make sure you're doing something for the right reasons and because otherwise you'll burn out or it will show in your work. And if you continue to do what your passion is, I think that um, things work out and doors open and things continue to move in the right direction if you just trust yourself. Okay, awesome. Um, well, thanks so much for sharing a little bit about your your journey with us. Um, I mean, it's just incredible what you've done to help during this time. Um, I think that, you know, that's my ideal inspiration, you know, people who they are out there solving problems that are big and they're scary. And, you know, a lot of times it's like the answer isn't there. We need to create it together and we need to collaborate. Um, so thank you for doing that. Um, what I'd like to do now is to open up the floor to Q&A. Um, so if you have any questions for Amanda, that would be um, great if you can either um, we'll allow you to unmute yourself, um, or you can go ahead and type your question in the chat box, and um, Meg Dad will help us ask it for you. So if you do have a question, go ahead and raise your hand, or go ahead and um, I, I, put I have your... Some, I have two questions. Okay. This is about uh, Hawaii in specific. So um, what how could Hawaii move toward a more sustainable economy? And, and follow up to that is, um, how can we move away from tourism and, and do something completely different and shift the, the focus of our economy into something else? And what is that thing that we can show, shift our economy to? That's the, that's the question of the year, right? I mean, I wish that I could solve that problem for us, uh, but it's something that we have been dedicated to. And I've I lived in Hawaii for 21 years now, and I think I started um, volunteering and doing work in sustainability in, shortly after I moved here. So I would say that 20 years later, um, things look a little bit better than they did, but we still have a long way to go. Um, local ag is a huge part of that. I think if we could get a decent plan in place to um, really support a local agriculture here, um, that would actually answer both of those questions, which I feel really excited when I get to answer two very difficult questions with one answer that feels easy. Um, it's not easy to do though. It's super complicated and it's going to take number one, much more dedication from our local administration um, to make that a priority. It's also, I think the easiest answer is gonna take us as consumers to demand that. And you know, you look at a pandemic where um, people didn't know how to communicate and now here everyone is on Zoom because of that. And so we were forced to, 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 to turn towards something. And I think COVID has done that in communication, but it's also created an opportunity for us to look at that from how we utilize our land and um, really lean in and trust the people who have been farming this land for a very long time in a sustainable manner. So for me, food and growing local food is a big part of the, the shift to be more sustainable. Um, but ultimately, I think that we all know deep down that it's really about our own personal choices and the choices we make with how we spend every dollar that we spend. Um, again, for us, the Feed the People program, we know that money is going to the farmer, money is going to a restaurant, and it's getting meals to somebody in need. To me, I feel really good telling a funder how I spent their dollar. Um, not to, you know, not to criticize anyone for anything else, but I also could have chose to use that dollar and purchase everything from the mainland for cheaper and bring it in. And someone might say that's a better idea because it's cheaper. 
but really is it because with the one dollar staying here in our local economy um how much does that you know move the dial and so i think for us to all take that as our own personal responsibility and really know that our dollars can be well spent to support the kind of future that we want to see um so amanda did you have any any thoughts on that well i think you, robin. the mic the question thank you robin and, and I agree that tourism will always be part of our economy here. So when I was asked what was one thing for us to be more sustainable and to shift to a more sustainable economy, I think that we will always have tourists here and I hope that we continue to have um, more mindful tourists. And I think that we can do a really good job of educating tourists. Again, as someone um, who's not from here and when my family from the Midwest comes here, it's really a big responsibility to sit them down and to educate them on how to be a mindful tourist when they arrive. Right. And I like to call them visitors. And especially, you know, as someone who is a visitor here and, and not from here, um, I, I was once that person who was coming here. And I hope that we're able to continue to welcome people back and to also get them to collaborate with us on um, caring for our community and and I think there's some really innovative programs that are happening probably with some of the people on this call that are finding ways to help um, visitors learn to be part of the solution a little bit more. And there's, I'm looking forward to, to what that looks like. And, you know, again, you know, I have cousins who've come here and they don't know better. We swim in lakes in Missouri and <laughs> Michigan and, yeah. and there you stand on a rock if, you know, if you're in the middle of the lake or walking in. And so is as silly as it sounds, I think some visitors are just uneducated on how to be a sustainable visitor. And so I hope that we can continue to help to educate them and how to do so. And maybe they'll bring it back home. That's right. That'd be awesome. Um, uh, Chris okay, asked do we a have a? We have two two questions from Chris and George, and then um, um, we we will have enough time for the rapid uh, twenty one rapid fire questions, hopefully. So uh, Chris asked, uh, "What is your current approach in networking and finding organizations to work with?" So I'm not sure if that's a question. Is that a question about um, organizations to work with for under my umbrella as far as the new clients, or is that specific to Chef Hui and working in feeding and education efforts? Do we know? Um, so my question is pretty much just like your general approach. Like, I guess you can give on both um, dimensions of what you're doing, but yeah, I'm kind of interested in like how, how, especially your approach is, especially right now. So I think for us, um, as far as under my umbrella and client wise goes, just to touch on that a bit, we've been really blessed because of all of the partners and the clients we've had in the past. That's how we've met new new partners and new clients in that sense. And I think we've we talked about it a, a little bit, but for me, really building trust in relationships is such an important part. And I think Hawaii is a very beautiful place in that that's embedded into the culture here. And you know, you go to lunch with someone and you get to know them before you do business together. And for some people, you know, like our busy folks in New York are like, I don't have, we don't have time for that. Like, let's, you know, let's just seal the deal. Let's make it happen. That really it's so much easier to work and you can work um, so much more efficiently when you've already built trust and you have this really great foundation of trust. So that's the approach we've always taken to our business is working with folks who come to us typically through a referral and getting to know them and them getting to know us so that we can um, do a lot of work together in a very efficient way. And I would say then to take it to Chef Hui and working with our community partners, um, it's a similar approach. And back to what Robin was talking about, there is limited funding, you know, this, this model of asking private donors to help feed people is not sustainable. And it's been a broken system for a long time. And that has to be an approach that we really take in how communities work together. So we try and stay on the outskirts and not have a huge present in the community, if at all possible. Um, we work with the community leaders. We find um, spaces like Papakulea and their community center. They already have staff on board and they're constantly connecting with their entire community community so they really know what that community's needs are so instead of us coming in out as outsiders and saying hey we're here to help you we just 
work with them and say, how can we be of service? And what are the things that your community might need? We try and get those things to that community and allow them to take on the kuleana of getting that out to their community, which then builds this beautiful sense of community supporting community. So I think that that is a great approach as well, is trying to find um, good people who have trusted relationships and seeing what you can learn from them. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Um, so think we have uh, one last question from George. This is an excellent question. Uh, what is your response to individuals and food buyers who say they wish they could buy more local food if it was more affordable? Um, what is Just to be clear, Amanda, like you did slightly answer this, um, but if there's anything you wanted to add to that answer, um, I posted the question before you answered that question. So. so, I mean, for us, it's, I think my question to everyone is, how can we make that possible for you? What is it that you need for that to be possible? If they could grow five times as much and you could buy five times as much from them, um, for a lower price point, would that work for you? Um, is it a transportation issue? Is it a, like, what's the why for the no? And I think that's always for me, again, the curios the curiosity is what drives it, is trying to problem solve what the no is about. And sometimes it's, it's legit. And sometimes it's like, okay, $8 a pound for local organic ginger. That's like, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work for the model that you have set up. However, um, if there's something where there can be a solution and we can help find a way to put the additional things in place that need to get it from you know A, B to C and make it an actual reality, um, sometimes it's not that far off. And we've really done that a lot with Fukunaga Produce, who is our main supporter for Chef Hui. And the majority for them, their majority of their business that they were selling to restaurants was not local. They had some local farmers, you know, for things like sweet potato and, and melons and um, zucchini and cucumbers and tomatoes when available. They bought those kinds of things. But anything from small farmers, um, they weren't really buying and they were bringing a lot in on on shipment from the mainland. But once we started collaborating together, we were able to introduce them to farmers who were able to produce some of the quantities that they needed that they didn't know existed. And we are able to figure out ways to get it from point A to point B. So I think just always approaching everything with curiosity and trying to see what how you can put things in place to turn the no into a yes. Um, is really important and our work with Fukunaga as we continue to um, to go through COVID, but I think onward, they will now have a much more balanced um, line of local products that they buy because they've established relationships with these farmers and it brings them joy to work with them. And they um, are finding that sometimes issues they had in shipping, they no longer have when they're working with a local vendor. So sometimes just taking a little bit of a risk to test out the new relationship. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you everyone for the, the questions for Amanda. Um, what we do want to finish with is with the 21 questions rapid fire. Um, but we also want to provide opportunities for folks to connect offline, um, but potentially still on Zoom. <laughs> so um, if you are interested in um, continuing the conversation with other entrepreneurs, please do drop your email address or your phone number and your name and, and your industry into the chat box um, so that other folks can, can jot it down and then you could um, you know, continue some of these conversations offline, um, picking up where you left off earlier. Um, but so we want to finish with um, the rapid fire questions. So we got 21 of them for you, Amanda. Um, so we'll get started. Okay. Um, so cats or dogs? Dogs. Beer or wine? Wine. Favorite app? Calm. Tell us about that. <laughs> what Calm. is that? Calm app. It's um, I we use it every night when we go to sleep. My daughters and I meditate together for ten minutes before we oh, go to calm sleep. Oh, the calm app. Yeah, oh, the yes. calm app, and it is such a good. There's story times. There's breathing. Um, and it's been it's been my go-to app for many years for 
calming down and getting out of my head and actually getting some sleep. Oh, awesome. Very cool. Um, favorite car? Oh, one that I'm not driving. <laughs> favorite book? Oh, um, you know, my books are, gosh, what is it? What would my favorite book be? I'm typically reading children's books. I would say most recently The Hungry Caterpillar. <laughs> yeah. I, I really enjoyed Michelle Obama's most recent book and I guess that's like my last adult book I got to read. So <laughs> that's gonna be my go-to. That's right. <laughs> um favorite movie or TV show? This is us, don't laugh. I love that show. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite artist? Musical. Musical artist? Yes. Oh. I should have I should have got these questions ahead of time. There's so many going like like why did Paula Abdul come to mind? She's definitely not my favorite artist, but that's what came to mind, so I'm going to go with it, I guess. We're going with it. We just got a record player and got my dad's old records and he was a big Paula Abdul fan, so maybe that's where that came from. Okay. <laughs> that's a fun one. Um your go-to karaoke song. Um Come on Baby Light My Fire. Okay. What TV sitcom family would you like to be a member of? I don't know any sitcom families. Um, yeah, none of them. I'm not a huge fan of sitcoms. Okay. Anything you collect? Friends. Any unusual skills or talents? I can still do a back handspring. Nice. Um, if a movie was made of your life, what genre would it be? Who would play you? Um, it would definitely be comedy, and I think my younger daughter, Eleanor, who is seven, would play me because she does amazing impersonations of me, especially ones of me when I'm mad. <laughs> um, what was your first job? My first job was as a gymnastics teacher. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Um, I still think that I would like to be a potter. That's on my list of goals. I, I think that that was actually my calling was to, to make pottery on a wheel um, and a landscape architect. I love playing in our garden. Very cool. Um, what is the best compliment someone can give you? Um, that I was kind. A cause you are passionate about? All, uh, so many. Um, right now, I'm really passionate about uh, about family services um, and about creating, about supporting organizations who help to create healthy families. I think it's such an important part of our of our um, future and of how people treat one another as adults. So, anything to do with supporting families. Okay, and then who are five people, dead or alive, that you would like to have dinner with? Um, Michelle and Barack Obama, does that go as two or one? I don't know. One Together dinner day, two people <laughs> and their daughters. Um, obviously, Oprah. Who doesn't want to have a meal with Oprah? Um, I would definitely love a sit down with Bob Marley as well. Um, My grandpa, my mom's dad, I have all these questions that I wish I would have asked him. And I would love to be able to go back and just have a long sit down dinner and whiskey on the rocks with my grandpa. Mm -hmm. um, and my dad, um, I miss him and I have so many questions I wish I would have asked him. Okay, um, what's one thing on your bucket list? Um, to travel the world with my family. It, that bucket's looking further and further away. <laughs> but, but, it, but it's still on the list. Um, I love spending time with my little tribe, just the four of us together. And I hope that we get to do that someday. Okay. And what's the strangest thing you've ever eaten? Oh, man. I've been to a lot of countries and eating a lot of weird things. Um... Probably when I was in Seoul, 
and we were in uh, this night market and a man was selling octopus and it was alive in the tank and he chopped it up and so it was like still alive. <laughs> and uh, the the vice president of the East West Center at the time says, I'll eat it if you'll eat it. And so I did. And luckily we both still lived the next day after eating the live <laughs> octopus out of the market. So I think that probably takes probably takes the cake. <laughs> well, our whole community is happy that you're <laughs> still around. Um, if you could trade lives with anyone for a day, who would it be? Oh, I think my husband, because I have so many questions about how his brain works to just actually live in it for a, a day, right. I think would make me understand him um, so much better. And I think he has a very like entertaining mind. So that's, yeah, my husband. Gotcha. And then if you had access to a time machine, where and when would you go? I would go to um, somewhere around the 1950s, kind of I'm thinking like Mad Men time. And the space isn't so much the case, but just being um, in that time when women were just getting into the workplace and there was all these really unique and interesting and odd things that were happening. Um, I'm very curious about that and would love to ask um, those women a lot of questions. <laughs> I could see you being a pioneer in that space too. <laughs> Awesome. Um, well, that's 21 questions. Um, so oh, that wasn't so bad. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we like to hear. Um, so yeah, so I wanted to thank everyone once again so much for joining us.